Lord Jesus, thank you for this opportunity to share about the value of life at all its stages, from conception to natural death. Help us see your face, your countenance, your image, and everyone we meet at all stages of life. In your name we pray. So I uh, got back from Colorado Springs just last night on a plane, uh, somewhat after midnight, and it was, uh, it was a wonderful conference. I'm sort of a, I always like to joke, I'm kind of the token Catholic among all my evangelical brothers and sisters that focus on the family. But it's a really life-giving conference in the sense of uh, these physicians that give advice to the ministry. And one of the things that uh, was most poignant yesterday was uh, one of my colleagues, a palliative care specialist in Canada, uh, Margaret Cottle, and she gave a 30-minute presentation that went over about 40 and none of us even noticed about this topic because um, she was so passionate about the hurt that she had about her profession that is lost and the reality that we've turned things upside down. Essentially, gravity is up, not down, and that uh, we don't value uh, life at its end. And in fact, I'll share a few of those details, not much because you're trying to cover a broad subject, but uh, you'll see what I mean in a minute when I um, go through some of that Canadian experience. But to begin with, Lois asked me to talk about this and particularly make this a youth track, although I see some of people who are not only my age, but even more. We have a, a senior citizen here in the, fu in the future, 95 years young, if she would, and we ought to praise God for her. Can, can anyone top that? I only hope that I can be as vibrant as you are when I'm by uh, your vintage. I'm getting there fast, so. If I hadn't almost died at 26, I wouldn't. Well, praise God you did not. All right, so uh, we'll begin. I always put the slide up here so I can remember and orient myself who I am. Uh, but, you know, I uh, have no disclosures. Whenever you do academic talks, you're supposed to say you don't have any disclosures. I work at this university that is there. You can see Mount Hood in the background. I work on the ninth floor of that large building where the tram goes down, and uh, tram's really a success story, even though there's a lot of controversy. You know, probably 15 to 20 million people, or 20 million rides have happened on that thing since it was built just 10, 12 years ago. It's, it's remarkable. The building I work in is a platinum award building. In other words, that means lead, lead, you know, like a energy efficiency, if you will. And uh, so, so efficient that they even recapture the, the rainwater and they recycle it through the toilets. So naturally, in a building like that, you have to have a, a sign there over the toilets say, <laughs> for those in the back, toilets and urinals uh, are flush with reclaimed water, so please don't drink. So, um, so this just goes to prove that uh, just because you're progressive doesn't mean that you have common sense uh, <laughs> here in the People's Republic of Oregon. So. These are the kinds of things I want to cover. I mean, just a little brief background, only so brief, because we only have about 40 minutes here and we have some Q&A. Uh, we're going to talk about the lessons learned, some of the problems with this paradigm. And some of you have seen some of these things, but I've updated in terms of statistics and all as well. And then I want to go through some timeless principles. We also have people, and I want to acknowledge Chuck Bentz, who's been with us since the beginning as well. Why don't you raise your hand, Chuck? He's going to be giving a presentation later. But there are those of us who are trying to follow these principles. They used to be taken for granted, and sadly today they are not. You really have to ask your doctor uh, what principles do they follow. And it has to be better than I'll try to do good. You know, well, define good, if you will. Uh, you know, Kevorkian thought he was doing good in the back of a Volkswagen van, uh, you know, some 25 years ago. So I, I, I share this picture, it's a death of Socrates, and it was, you know, about 400 BC, uh, thereabouts, 300, whatever, before the birth of Christ. And you see Socrates pictured in this, in this beautiful image of uh, about to drink hemlock because he was corrupting the youth of Athens. And if you look at the picture, there are actually people in there who are really anxious and angst. They have angst over this beloved teacher and all having to essentially take hemlock because his political views weren't in sync with the powers to be. But think about that, that the punishment for him, even though he was more willing to stand by his principle, the people agonizing over his soon-to-be um, dead body, but the, the, the reality at that time was that you, if you said the wrong thing, uh, you'd be punished. And so killing yourself or taking an overdose was a punishment. 
And you think about that in the death penalty as well, the very ingredients that we now hear about from the doctors who do this are, you know, the same, the same three ingredients that you use for the death penalty. Now, most people are moving away from being in favor of the death penalty. We have ways to keep our society safe, and all Europe outlawed it, but they basically take a drug to put you to sleep, to relax you first, I guess, and they put, give you a drug to put you to sleep, and then they put, give you a drug that paralyzes your muscles so you can't breathe. So think of this. This is a punishment. So how does it turn around now, where in Canada that's the preferred way to end people's lives, is with those three drugs? Or even four now. They're going to four to be sure, because sometimes the three don't work. So in the background, you know, this is a, the timeline back when Hippocrates or Socrates ended his life. There was a Hippocratic tradition that maybe doctors shouldn't be involved in this, and then in the, the late 19th century, 1870, Samuel Williams, who was a school teacher, actually came up with the idea that perhaps the solution to suffering was the end of the life of the sufferer. And there were only a couple drugs at that time. There was ether and morphine. And then moving on down into this last century, 20th century, before we are in our current century, there was the Euthanasia Society of America that morphed into the Society for Right to Die. Now you start seeing the euphemisms appear because euthanasia was somewhat, especially in the 30s and 40s, was not something as a popular idea. And so you have to change the name. And now, so you sort of understand how, what the tactics are going on in order to promulgate this paradigm. And in the 73, there was the famous Postma case in the Netherlands. Postma was actually a family or general practitioner, as they called them. So was his wife. And his wife's mother, was ill, and they ended up ending her life because she was suffering in the minds of these two doctors, husband and wife. And she was, he was taken before the medical board and the like, in the, and even the justice system, but they were so sympathetic with the mentality of that it wasn't really murder, and they did um, say that he was guilty, or they were guilty of ending her life, but they gave him a $1 fine, or the equivalent of a $1 fine, whatever they... Netherlands currency is. And more currently for us, this all started back in the 80s when Derek Humphrey, who is a British writer at the time, and he came to the United States under some nefarious circumstances because he'd ended the life of his first wife and wrote a book about it. It was called Gene's Way. And so this was a mentality that he had that some lives, when you get close to the end, are not worth living as well. So this whole mentality is totally in violation of the Hippocratic tradition. But he's important because, and the story that I can tell you about him was captured in Rita Marker's book here. It's called Deadly Compassion. Deadly Compassion is a story that came about because Rita Marker, who understood some of the things I'm sharing with you long before I understood it was on the radar screen, had debated publicly and privately Derek and his wife, Anne Humphrey. And so when it came time that Anne was one time, Anne Humphrey, the wife of Derek Humphrey, was in their home just outside of Eugene, I think in Junction City, and she was in the shower and she noticed that she had a, a breast lump. And this is well documented in the, in the book. And she comes downstairs and greets her husband with this news. And instead of, uh, you know, giving the usual um, response that I think you think most people would have fear and anxiety about what this meant. She said, you know, I think this is cancer, and you don't have to worry, Derek. If, if, I, if, if it is cancer, I'm not going to go through chemotherapy and radiation. I'm not going to become a living skeleton. I'm not going to do all that. I wouldn't do that to you, and I wouldn't do that to me. And Derek just smiled. He went off to work without kissing her goodbye that day, and that was the beginning of a journey that led to this book. Why did it lead to the book? Because she changed her mind subsequently. And the board of directors of then the youth, or the Hemlock Society, as it was called then, it was closer to the real purpose of the society, that is to get people to take poisons to kill themselves. It's subsequently morphed into so-called compassion and choices. But at that time, it was the Hemlock Society. So the board of directors, when she changed her mind and wanted to get treatment, kind of closed circle and ostracized her, and she felt very isolated and alone. This is an important factor, because one of the things that keeps us going is we're not islands. We have people that care about us and love us, or we don't, and that's what causes us to feel despondent about our future or lack of future in our lives. So at this point, she reaches out, oddly enough, because Rita Markers made an impression with her that she 
actually does care about people. And Rita Marker takes her husband's airline miles and flies on a bullet trip to Portland, to Eugene, Oregon, and spends a month with Rita, which is the basis for this book is the relationship that developed over the next couple of years between Rita and Anne. Unfortunately, Anne ultimately, about two years later, did take her life, and that's the end of the story. But the friendship is what allowed Rita to give the to write this book, and she writes it very gently and understates it, if, if anything, with all very well referenced throughout the book. So I encourage you to read that. That gets you the history of how did this all come about. So what happened then with this uh, effort with Derek Humphrey with the so-called Hemlock Society is that they tried to push this thing through California, tried to push it through Washington. In both those cases, they lost about 54 to 46. But they learned a lot from those efforts in California and Washington. They had on those bills the idea that we could inject drugs, and it was just too easy for people like me and you that don't believe that we should be killing people as a solution to suffering to show a commercial, black and white, with the doctor drawing up a deadly drug and showing really who, who got the power. Was it the person or was it the, the doctor? And it was defeated, but still not by very much, which shows you the utilitarian mentality of our cultures these days, or lack of culture. But they learned that we should just do it like a Hollywood, you just take a pill and you slip quietly off to sleep. And in 1994, there was a narrow passage, for those of you who are here, 51-49 in a ballot measure, and we lost that. You know, I remember my neighbor at that time saying, Bill, this will never pass. And, you know, I had more of a sense of the society going downhill. And indeed, um, sadly, he, he was not correct, and my concerns and fears were. And so in 1994, some of my colleagues, uh, Bill Petty and others, actually uh, tried to challenge the law that it would be a conflict of interest for doctors, that it would be an inherent conflict for people who couldn't swallow pills because this Hollywood image isn't really an efficient way to end people's lives. And the judge in Eugene, actually, Judge Hogan at the time, <clears throat> said that, you know, in a 40-page opinion, these plaintiffs were correct. And, of course, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals got the appeal and they have been overturned about half the time by the Supreme Court, but they're very liberal. And then a 100-page counter-argument, they said that these guys didn't have standing, and in fact, it would be something that would be impossible to do. And so about the same time as it got untied in the courts, and the circuit court or the Ninth Circuit Court overruled it, it also came back to the, to the, to the voters. And in fact, that was a large part because of our group, Physicians for Compassionate Care, trying to give backbone to the legislatures to, to reverse this misguided decision. And we, as a medical society, actually voted 121 to 1 that we should, we should oppose Measure 16, as assisted suicide is outlined in Measure 16 because it's seriously flawed, which was a monumental work to try to get the doctors to actually agree in that, that, that much. And that gave the legislatures the courage to put it back to the voters. Unfortunately, the voters then uh, rejected the repeal, and the, why did they do it was not about the actual issue itself, no longer were the arguments, it was about those Christians trying to impose their morality on, on you, and that became what we were voting on, is somebody imposing their va values. And this is a total misguided thing, and in fact now as we get people having been forced to participate or to refer across the country, and certainly in Canada, we have a real clear sense of who's imposing their morality or lack of morality on whom. So there was also an effort through the federal government to try to block it because this is using controlled substances for purposes for which they were not intended. They were intended to relieve suffering, not to kill people. And unfortunately, Janet Reno, who was, I think, the attorney general under President Clinton, overturned the DEA regulator who correctly interpreted that we shouldn't be using controlled substances. That's why they're controlled, is so people don't overuse them or misuse them and kill themselves. And so we're totally turning, again, gravity's up, it's not down. So why do people do this? Well, you know, that has been pretty well studied in many different locales, including Oregon, which has the longest history, it's almost a quarter century now. But they don't do it because of pain, which is the bottom issue here. They do it because of losing autonomy, feeling like their no, life has no longer got dignity, they don't want to be burdens on others. Those are the principal things. And pain shows up last. And why does it show up last? Well, 
um, because it's really not an issue. We have the tools to control pain, even to the point of conscious sedation if we needed to do that, which, by the way, after 40-some years of practice myself, I've never had a patient we had to use conscious sedation on. The goal for me is to try to keep the person so that they are sentient, at least at times, and able to interact with the world. And then that is something that is a tool. And if you did that, and they passed away, and your intention was simply to relieve their suffering, that would be okay. That would be a side effect, much like if I give penicillin to a patient for a sore throat, and they, God forbid they have an anaphylactic reaction and they die. That's a double effect. I didn't give the penicillin with the idea that I was going to cause a phenomenal allergic reaction that took their life. And that's the same true with pain. So you can treat pain aggressively, and that's what these controlled substances are for. And, you know, and, and morphine is like God's gift to the dying. I heard that from a palliative care hospice nurse. And, uh, you know, she had a beautiful countenance about her. She, she talked about all these people who talk about death. And she said, well, I've lived it. You know, I've taken care of hundreds of people. And really, morphine is God's gift to the dying. She was on 60 Minutes when, that, when she made that statement. I was on the same little program with Morley Safer being interviewing God Rest His Soul. He was pro-assisted suicide, sadly. But fortunately, the producer, the associate producer, was not. And so that 60-minute segments we showed to our medical students for several years in the course I used to control in, the, in the OHSU because it was so fair and balanced. And that star of the show was the person who actually took care of the dying was that hospice nurse. So what about pain? Does it cause people to want to kill themselves? Well, actually, people are fearful of pain. In fact, when I say pain is the sixth reason, it's not because they're actually in intractable pain. It's because they fear pain. They're afraid of these circumstances where they'd be miserable and, and life would no longer be worth living. So it's interesting that over time, if even people thought they might want to end their lives, over time as they get good care, good palliative care, the kind of things that Dr. Benz does, and I strive to do as well, following the example of people who really specialize in this area, or like Margaret Cottle, the, the woman in, who has such angst in Canada, who's a palliative care expert. So that whole field didn't exist 50 years ago. And, and now we have really the tools to deal with it. And sadly, when they have more tools than ever to, to take care of people, the sphere is being promulgated throughout the world. So graphically, if you look at this graph, the acceptance for assisted suicide euthanasia is on the vertical axis. So the acceptance when they're not in pain is higher than when they're actually in pain. It's a little bit like, you know, I wouldn't want to live with a horrible back pain or if I had to use a walker or if I had to, you know, have a respiratory device at night or have to be on oxygen. And the closer you get to actually doing those things, and you realize, well, you know, that's not that bad. You know, I can speak for experience. You know, I've had back pain since I was 15 years old. I have a little defect in my lower spine, you know. But, you know, life is better now than ever. I'm 70 years old. Uh, so, but when I was 15, if you told me that I'd have all these maladies or whatever else, you know, I'd be really anxious. I'd be fearful. You know, and so we've got, when people have fear, we've got to address their fear. So Derek Humphrey, the guy that I just featured in the book there, uh, he said immediately within a year of this thing passing, this is a solution to high cost of health care. Erin Hoover Barnett used to cover this. I don't know what she does now. I think she still writes for the Oregonian. But the reality, this is in 1998. It hasn't really been in place at this point for for a year. You know, the first case was in January of 1998. But this is true, and I'm going to show you some of the evidence for what Derek Humphrey is being honest here. By the way, I debated him one time. It was actually, he's easy to debate, not because I'm brilliant, but because he's honest. You know, I brought up the referral issue. He says, well, you shouldn't be asked to do that. Well, maybe you don't believe that, Derek, but everybody else on your side seems to think that if I can't refer for abortion, for whatever contraceptive tool or what, for assisted suicide, I shouldn't practice medicine. That's what they say. I'm not making this up. So I'm going to just go show you a little vignette here. Many of you may have seen this, but only a few things have leaked underneath the shot of secrecy about what's going on with this paradigm. So I'm going to just share you Barbara Wagner is a woman who's a school bus driver in her previous life. She's got cancer. It's been under control for years. And then it came back. And her oncologist wanted to give her a drug called Tarceva. Tarceva is not a drug that would cure the cancer, but just like with my late wife, there were at least five or six drugs that might slow it down. Statistically, Tarceva would be able to give her an increased chance of being alive in one year, a 45% increased chance of being alive in one year. So 
This is her story, and I'll let you go from there. Her doctor offered hope in this bottle, the new chemotherapy drug Tarceva. Like my doctor said, maybe this can put the lid on it and stop it. That hope shattered with this letter from the Oregon Health Plan, telling her we were unable to approve the cancer treatment. It will pay for comfort care, including physician aid in dying, better known as assisted suicide. I told him, you know, I said, who do, these, who do you guys think you are? You know, to say that you'll, you'll pay for my um, dying, but you won't pay to help me possibly live longer. We took our concerns to Dr. Sam Saha, chairman of the commission that sets policy for the Oregon Health Plan. She says, to say to someone, we'll pay for you to die, but not pay for you to live, it's cruel. I don't think anyone's saying that. I don't think anyone's saying that. That's, uh, I think, maybe an unfortunate uh, interpretation of the letter. Assisted suicide critic Dr. William Toffler calls the message disturbing. People deserve relief of their suffering, not giving them an overdose. And he says the state has a financial incentive to offer death instead of life. Chemotherapy drugs like Tarceva cost $4,000 a month. Drugs for assisted suicide cost less than 100. Is it cheaper to pay for somebody to die than to help them live? That is uh, not a question that we think about. Um, we don't think about uh, um, we don't think about investing our healthcare dollars in that way. Yet when thinking about patients like Barbara Wagner, Dr. Saha admits they must consider the state's limited dollars. If we invest thousands and thousands of dollars in one person's days to weeks, uh, yet we are taking away those dollars from someone. The body language there is uh, very telling and I, I could tell from the chuckle going through, the, through all of you that you, you saw it very clearly. And it is. I mean, it's not maybe not something they like to think about, but it is clearly uh, the justification. And he's just living out what Derek Humphrey. Now, this is the Oregon Health Plan. So this is the state's largest medical management, managed care marketplace, if you will, in the very state. Now, we know of at least two cases like Barbara Wagon. We have no idea how many other countless because there's a shroud of secrecy over this whole process. So it's not the only issue with this. There's also the problem with disabled. This is actually Patrick Matheny, who is a person who lived on the coast, he lived in a little trailer behind his, father, his parents' house, he would go through cyclical depression through his life. He got a prescription because he had ALS and he knew that at some point he's going to die and so basically he gets through the mail from my institution, Oregon Health and Science University, uh, the prescription, the lethal prescription. He keeps it, and then one time, at some point, he actually decides it's bad, and I'm going to go ahead and take the overdose. He can't really swallow well, which is one of the complications of ALS or advanced Parkinson, like my late father had. And so his brother-in-law was reported in this story to have to have helped him to end his life. He wouldn't say how. No one did any investigation. The Oregon Health Division is keeping track of the second and third-hand reporting, and they're not able to... Uh, do any investigation, they're not charged with that, and they're not funded for any investigation. So no one knows to this day how his brother-in-law helped him. Now, was it a pillow that he used to smother him? Was it the drug that he used and actually put it into a needle and injected it, you know, solubilized it? We don't know. So the attorney general, in hearing about this plight, he says basically, well, um, it may discriminate against people who can't swallow. And indeed it does. In fact, that was part of Judge Hogan's decision back in 1994, 95, when we were trying to stop it through the courts. So he said, in order to eliminate this, we would require euthanasia is the only way to do it. And in fact, you know, this is what has happened now in other countries. In fact, in Canada to our north, it's also happening in our legislature. They're changing the law. This very week, they're debating these kinds of things. Uh, this past week, and they put the bill out, House bill and Senate bills, to try to make the word ingest. Now, usually I think about ingest as digestion and the GI tract. Well, ingest is now going to encompass however a person takes it is ingesting it. You can't make this up. This is how the language gets distorted. So, oh, everything's going swimmingly in Oregon. There is no slippery slope. So this was another case that leaked out through the media. This is Erica and her mother, Kate Cheney. 
Kate was actually a, devi a survivor of one of the concentration camps in World War II. She uh, clearly had a, a tough resilience about her, but at some point she was very independent. Her daughter Erica said that if things got worse with her, that she had always expressed an issue that she wanted to die. So she goes to one of my colleagues, a psychiatric colleague at OHSU, and she, that Linda, Linda Ganzini, and she basically, Dr. Ganzini says, well, I'm not sure who's really requesting the suicide. Is it the daughter or is it Miss Cheney, uh, Kate, the survivor of Auschwitz or Dachau, whatever prisoner of war camp she was in, or whichever death camp she was in. So she goes to a second person, and that is a psychologist, and he doesn't use the word coercive. The daughter seems to be coercive, but he also is not sure who's really asking for it. She goes to a third person affiliated with the Kaiser system, a managed care system that will make more money the less it does. You know, there's conflict of interest in all kinds of healthcare, including mine, which is generally fee for service. What's the conflict of interest for me for fee for service? Well, the more I do, the more I make. But if you're in a managed care system, the less you do, where you pay a fee and you put certain amounts of step in, and the less you do, you make money. So even if, if it was to be done in Kaiser, they should have had an outside person decide so that it wouldn't be this inherent conflict of interest. But conflicts of interest don't seem to be too much of a bother for people pushing this agenda. So also, taking things orally, you know, don't always work. People do vomit them, they do regurgitate them. Sometimes they metabolize them more quickly so that the drug that might be lethal for one person is not for another. So this was the case of David Pruitt, I believe is his name. And basically, he took the overdose, the correct amount, and 67 hours he wakes up, and I'm quoting, he said, what the hell happened? I thought I was supposed to be dead. So he, he, they had a full-page story featuring his residents and everything and pictures and the like. And they basically, uh, he, he said, well, God must have wanted me to live longer. It was an epiphany for him. And so he did. He lived and died naturally, I think only about 11 or 12 days later. But his wife was elated. His wife had been fallen in this trap that many loved ones do as they say, well, that's your wish. I'm going to respect your wishes, right? That's what they say. No pushback. But when he didn't die, she was elated that she still had her beloved husband. So whenever somebody says to you, I want to be dead, you might want to say, gosh, you must be hurting. Tell me about that. Instead of, well, you seem to express this over and over again. Do you want me to help you? Now, which is the compassionate response, I ask you? It sounds pretty dispassionate to me when you do the... The, the latter, you know, or the former, when I, when I was saying, you know, gee, how would you like me to help you? Or I often like to refer to it as the vending machine response. You know, do you want to help, do you want my help in helping you to live, to take care of you, or do you want me to help you to kill yourself? It's the vending machine song. So, why am I not dead? So this is the statistics, the latest ones that we got just this February or March from the Oregon Health Division. Again, these are all secondhand reporting. So this is what they say is happening based on doctors who aren't there 84% of the time. So how do they know? Well, the family said this is what happened. Nobody asked, is somebody getting an inheritance from this early demise? And that has happened. There are also people who have lost their houses because somebody helped them. So you see the green line is where basically these are the numbers of prescriptions written and then the deaths are in the purple line. But there were like 249 prescriptions written last year. How many people got psychiatric referrals out of those 249 prescriptions that got written people? Well, some years it is zero, but last year we're three. So, and by the way, psychiatrists say, and they're honest about this when they have integrity and speaking about this, they can't be sure about depression even after an hour and a half interview as far as the diagnosis, because it's kind of a subjective call, isn't it? And people can kind of hide that very well. This is actually, I guess, a little slide introducing it here. Things have changed in Oregon here. And the sign, if you can't read it in the back, says it's the bereaver state. <laughs> and why, why do we earn that title? Well, if you listen to this next story, is one of my other colleagues, along with Chuck Benson and all, who's helped, helped us with Physicians for Compassionate Care to try to keep this bottled up in Oregon and not have it spread across the country and the world, is, is actually... Uh, Dr. Ken Stevens, and she, he has a patient, Jeanette Hall, who is a um, person who found out that she had colorectal cancer, and she had actually voted for assisted suicide herself, 
And so Dr. Stevens had the, the response that I suggest that you tell me about yourself and what you're thinking about and, uh, and have a conversation. I couldn't believe death was at my door. And I thought, surely that can't be right. Death, he's saying six months to a year to live. It was life and death. I just knew I didn't want to suffer. One day I was bleeding so bad that they had to take me by ambulance to the hospital. The doctor came in and said, Jeanette, you have colon cancer. And it didn't hit me. I just went, I have to go. I have to take care of my mother. I have to do my work. I have to go. And they said, you don't understand. You, you have cancer. When I first met Miss Hall, she had been evaluated by her surgeon. Her surgeon had determined that the cancer was inoperable, meaning that it could not be cured with surgery. So he referred her to me for radiation and uh, also chemotherapy. She immediately told me, uh, she said, I'm not here for the treatment, Dr. Stevens, I'm here for the pills. Two years ago, I voted for Oregon's assisted suicide law, and that's what I want, I'm here for the pills. I don't want radiation, I don't want chemotherapy. I reached that point without hope. I was sinking into depression. I said, Miss Hall, would you come back and see me next week? Let's talk about this some more. I was able to get better acquainted with her, and I learned that she had a son who was attending the police academy. He was in his late 20s. And I said, Miss Hall, wouldn't you like to see him graduate? He was single. I said, wouldn't you like to see him get married? Uh, does he know what you're considering here? It made me realize there was hope. There was something to live for. And I thank him for that one sentence that brought me back to reality and made me try. So she did accept the, the treatment. She uh, received chemotherapy and radiation. She lost her hair temporarily, uh, but the tumor just melted away. Dr. Stevens, if you had believed in physician-assisted suicide, I wouldn't be here. You didn't give up on me. You didn't abandon me, and that's why I'm still here. These are the kind of doctors we need that give you hope when your hope is gone. Here I am 15 years later, and I went to my son's graduation. It's great to be alive. So I've been proud, as I know Chuck has, to be a colleague of Dr. Stevens, who's still practicing radiation therapy, even though you're supposedly retired like I did years ago. So the, the reality is that uh, that very case, that true statement, I, I, I'll never abandon my patient, yet one of the things that's said about people like Dr. Stevens, Dr. Benson, and me, is that we will abandon our patient if we don't give them deadly drugs to kill themselves. It's just, again, gravity's up. So. What's happening outside of Oregon? So you see a map here. This is actually from the so-called Compassion and Choices people. They actually show where they're actually, the yellow dots are where they're organized and they're really trying to promulgate this. I had gone to uh, Louisiana a few weeks ago to speak at a conference there. Um, this John Paul II Foundation puts on conferences. They're up to 22 a year. It's a wonderful organization and they're trying to arm a state that is pretty conservative, you don't see a, a yellow dot there in Louisiana. It's too tough a road because the population is not seduced by this paradigm. On the other hand, the blue states, there are six states that have actually passed this. There are others across the country, including New Jersey, Maryland, New Mexico, Oregon, and in terms of extending its uh, boundaries, the so-called six months to live and the 15-day waiting period. You know, interesting side on that, too. A couple of years ago, they tried to, ex to get rid of the, um, they, got, they tried to extend it uh, with one of their bills just a couple of years ago, and both sides were opposed to it. And you sort of say, why would the pro-euthanasia side be opposed to uh, expanding the criteria for the bill? Well, they were both opposed, we are 
of course, opposed to it. We don't want to expand assisted suicide euthanasia as a solution to suffering. But the pro forces were trying to pass it in 25 other states. And if you extended it here in Oregon, like they're trying to do just this last week, then it would give lie to the whole notion of, oh, you can circumscribe it, if you will. So both sides KO'd the bill a couple of years ago. I think now they're more blatant and bold, and so they're pushing it again this year. So um, that's oh, the back. Now, I want to share a little bit about um, Canada. And even though this clip is a little a year old, I can tell you that there are over 2,000 deaths now in Canada, and they're all by euthanasia. Almost, only five of them, as of the last reading, were by assisted suicide. Why is that? Because they looked at Oregon, and instead of having this blind eye to the problems with assisted suicide in Oregon, like with the David Pruitt case, they said, you know, if you're going to do this, then you need those three drugs, just like the death penalty. You need to tranquilize the person, you need to put them to sleep, and then you give them a muscle paralyzing agent. So this is what's happening by this in Canada. Quebec's, doc Quebec's doctors are set to become the first in the country to practice legal euthanasia. Beginning on December 10th, the province will become the only jurisdiction in Canada allowing doctors to assist in the death of a patient. As Mike Armstrong reports, it is a sensitive subject and each case will be handled according to strict guidelines. It is the exact opposite of what doctors are used to. Instead of prolonging life, next week Quebec physicians will find out how they will end life. After months of analyzing the experiences in other countries, jurisdictions like Belgium and the Netherlands, Quebec has developed its own model. For us, it was important that it has to be done in a short period of time and with a better control on the effect. Now, in some places, euthanasia is done orally with pills, but there have been problems, patients who can't swallow or throw them up. Quebec will instead use a sequence of injections, a kit with three different medications. They'll be given intravenously one after another. The first will be a drug to relax the patient, something like Valium. The second will be a barbiturate, a drug to put the patient into a coma. The last one will be a muscle paralyzing drug that will stop the patient's lungs. There will also be extra medication in the event the first doses aren't enough. If it doesn't work, there is a possibility of having the same drugs with the same dosages uh, twice in the same kit. The whole process, we're told, will take about 15 minutes. Dr. Mitch Shulman is commending the College of Physicians. Its plan, he says, is well thought out and it's being released early enough for doctors to discuss it and prepare for it. And this is something most doctors have no experience with. My job is to bring you back from death, to stop death in its place. Over the next couple of months, doctors will be given training sessions. Each hospital will, by law, as of December, have to provide this new service. There will be strict criteria on who's eligible. Patients have to give consent and be suffering from an incurable condition. Now, doctors can refuse to help patients die, and some are promising to fight the law. It's a homicide. I mean, up until now, it's always been a crime, right, to do that. And now it's a, something that they call a health care, which I don't agree with. The Quebec experience will have an impact in the rest of the country. Other provinces are already watching closely how this system is being set up. The Canadian Medical Association is calling for national standards from coast to coast. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Montreal. So the problem with places like Quebec, they're forcing doctors to to be involved in this, either directly or referring. And so, you know, the notion of referring is, uh, is an anthema to me. I, will, I would go to jail before I would participate in this actively. And we all need to actually be, have the courage to do whatever we have to do to, um, to eliminate that possibility of us participating in evil. So I'm gonna go through some real quick lessons. Uh, you have a short history of medicine here. This will not take long. You have a pain, so in 2000 before Christ, 2000 years, here, eat this root. Then 1000 years before Christ, that, that root is heathen. Here, say this prayer. 1850, after death, uh, the prayer is superstitious. Here, drink this potion. And then 1940, potions are snake oil. Here, take antibiotics. And then now, antibiotics are artificial. Here, take this root. <laughs> so, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. And so what are the lessons we can learn here? Well, uh, I heard this actually from Bernard Nathanson, who was like the father of abortion, you know, who actually was a convert ultimately and was very much dead set against abortion. He spent almost a half million dollars of his 
money trying to put the genie in the bottle, but this is the first time I heard that phrase was from Bernard Nathans, and he said, all social engineering is preceded by verbal engineering. And think of that when you hear words. I mean, the whole notion, when I was debating somebody in, in um, where was I, Ann Arbor, not, not long ago, she, she made that point up front. She was pro-euthanasia, or at least she said she was neutral, an impossible position. You're either for it or you're against it. But she said, basically, the playing field is in Dr. Toffler's favor now because um, we've called this session assisted suicide as opposed to medical aid in dying, death with dignity, choice in dying. I'm, in for, I'm actually for all those things, you know? I'm just not interested in killing people to, uh, to, to relieve suffering. So these, these no, notions are critical in driving the debate. The media tends to go with this whole paradigm without ever questioning and getting into the depths. You know, for instance, even in the debate, I had 12 minutes to cover a topic that the New York, New York State Task Force on Life and Law back in the 90s took 10 years with an eclectic group of people. And they said, as a conclusion, with all these different 24 people from every walk of life, there were nurses, teachers, parents, everybody, doctors, rabbis, priests, they said, you know, even though there are some hard cases, it should never be legal in the state of New York because it's too dangerous. And they were right. But we ignore that for the sound bites. Reason dialogue's hard. Again, like in Oregon, let's not really talk about the subject. Let's talk about you imposing your morality. You're a Christian, so it doesn't count. Then you have lies. Patty Rosen was this woman who ended her life her daughter's life, who had a cancer, and she claimed the daughter was in horrible, intractable pain. You'd turn her over and her bones would break, and all these claims. She claimed that she gave her daughter an overdose. It wasn't until five days before the vote that it became clear Patty Rosen lied. She told the nursing school here at OHSU that she actually had to hit a vein because the overdose didn't work. And, the, and her other daughter, other children were running around, should we get a pillow and smother their child, and of course, Patty, understanding the psychological implications of smothering somebody uh, as a nurse, had to, quote, hit a vein. We know that getting together like our group, Physicians for Compassionate Care, by the way, it's pccef.org. You can actually join as a, whether you're a physician, nurse, or whatever, as an associate member. You can try to support us in our work of trying to spread the truth about this misguided paradigm. Um, but this works. There's the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition in Canada. By the way, there's a movie called Fatal Flaws that was shown here in Portland a couple months ago and also in Salem and in Medford. It was sponsored by Oregon Right to Life. If you haven't got it, it, it is the only film of its kind that allows people to talk on both sides in their own voices. It's, it allows a real discussion showing little video clips and re realities of, in the Netherlands and Canada and Oregon. It's a wonderful film, Fatal Flaws, and you can get it online. So legislation and rulings, actually this is not a bad forum because believe it or not, as much as we like to pick on our legislatures, they actually have hearings that go on for hours, sometimes days, weeks, and you actually can talk in paragraphs, maybe for only three minutes, which you can do it. I submitted testimony with the help of Jessica and Oregon Right to Life just this past Friday. Right? No, it was on Thursday. You had only 24 hours to, to submit it. But you ought to do that. Your voice can be heard. It only takes a paragraph or two. It only takes you, you know, 10, 15 minutes to put it, put it in. Use, use your power, your intellect to say, you know, this is wrong. Creating fear is important. Remember, in the abortion issue, what's the symbol of fear? It's the coat hanger. Right. There were no coat hangers. Those were things that were done in the back door of an office that when 73 came around, that's the front door. But the point is you want to create fear. So what's the fear at the end of life? You're going to be trapped alive on respirators. Well, today, my fellow brothers and sisters, it is more difficult to get care than people doing things to you that you don't want. It's all too easy to say, I don't want that. So it's not, it's not like it was when I first entered medicine when maybe we were doing a lot of so-called futile things. The slippery slope is real. I've given you some examples of that. Coverage is now funded by tax dollars, and it basically some things are not covered. In the Netherlands, they have life passports, where basically they say, don't kill me, don't euthanize me if I can't speak for myself, because there are over 1,000 people a year that have this category called LWERP, end of life without explicit request or permission of the patient. Now, what is that? There's a shorter word for that. It's only, I think, six letters. 
I didn't ask for it, but you did it to many. So why would doctors do that? We trust doctors, and that's what the anthropologist from North Carolina that I was debating a couple weeks ago said. Well, I said, you know, there are a million doctors, and they all don't have the same level of integrity that Dr. Benz has, Dr. Stevens has. And you, uh, no longer there's a trust problem now among many people. Dr. Benz has difficulty with who does he refer, which hospice does he go? There's some hospices that seem to be... Um, helping people exit quickly rather than giving them best care until they live as long as they can. So a little quote here. I'm going to take a little nap. Watch my plugs, will you? <laughs> the fear is real, and it, it, it is real. So um, how do we best cope? When people say things to you, this could be your own family members, I want to die, what are they really saying? I may feel useless. They say, I don't want to be a burden. Are they asking for you to reassure them that they're not a burden? Um, I don't want to be on a respirator. Well, they're fearful of being in control and having control over their lives. Uh, I've lived a life, a long life already. I'm tired. I'm afraid I can't keep going. What are they really saying? I might as well be dead. Maybe they feel nobody really cares about them. And you can change this. This is something that happened in my own life with one of my patients just a couple of weeks ago. His, father, his wife had died. They'd been married 57 years. And he's starting to talk about assisted suicide. Fortunately, I had a long enough relation with him that I could cajole with him and I could banter with him and say, you know, I like, I like visiting with you. I don't want you to die. I want to see you back in two weeks. He's depressed. Of course he's depressed. He was depressed just as I was almost five years ago when my late wife of 40 years died. So how we respond to, makes a huge difference to people's decision making. So how should we respond? This is it. These are the basic principles. Not very complicated. All human life, you heard that in the previous session, all human life has inherent value. No one has the right to do wrong. You know, Lincoln said that. This, is, uh, this was about slavery. No one has the right to do wrong. No one can serve two masters. Either I'm going to be your advocate for health and well-being, or I'm going to be your advocate for your hastened demise. I can't do both. And we and you should be unabashed in your advocacy for the health and well-being of people at all stages of life, regardless of disability. One of our allies is the not dead yet group. You know who they are? They're disabled people who recognize when you start talking about the utility of your life and having no meaning or no dignity, um, they're talking about them. So who's my role model? And this lady is my heroine, and uh, she had the kind of phrases, the beautiful little capsulated phrases of, uh, you know, everything. If, you know, if, it's, if a child isn't wanted, give them to me, is what she said. You know, that this is, uh, none of us can do great things, but all of us can do small things with great love, and together we can do something wonderful. She had the pithiest phrases possible, and then she lived it out, and that's what I would ask all of us to do. So that's all I have to say today. I appreciate being able to be here, and if there are any questions, I'll be glad to have them. Well, the question, if anybody couldn't hear it, was what kind of... Um, what kind of philosophy are they getting about this end-of-life thing about physician-assisted suicide? Well, one, they're, they're often indoctrinated with death with dignity. When I was in charge of the largest course in the medical school, we had a controversy in medicine session. We deliberately had people with both sides be able to speak in their own voice about this. And we usually came out ahead because it was an hour-long session. And over the time, I think this was a fair and balanced way. Unfortunately, now, in my residency just two or three years ago, they had a three-hour session and it was all with six people who are pro-assisted suicide teaching our residents how do you go about doing this, how do you access the system. They had invited me initially, and then as I showed up with my 30-minute PowerPoint, they basically said, well, we don't want to have you. We're not really talking about the controversy. We're just talking about how to do it. And I got kind of indignant because I had been invited and I never got a formal disinvitement. And so I said, you know, I'd like to have some equal time. So the following week or two, I got back and I had... Fortunately, a whole hour to talk about this, but unfortunately, it's not the same people that come to the conference, as you know, from one, week, one day or one week to the next. So the sad thing is that the, the, the school tries to characterize itself as being neutral. Well, you can be neutral about vanilla and chocolate, but you can't be neutral about slavery. You can't be neutral about wife abuse, child abuse. Being so-called neutral is being, well, I'm, I'm for this under some circumstances is what that means. In fact, I was in a debate once with Linda Ganzini being a neutral person, a woman who'd done the studies on assisted suicide and all, and had said Kate Cheney's daughter seemed to be coercive. 
And then they had somebody pro-euthanasia, and then they had me, three people. So Linda would say things like, well, you know, sometimes I don't think this is a very good idea, and other times I kind of think it is. So it was like a one and a half to one debate, at least. You know, it, it's a, a maybe two to one, because she seemed to be so reasonable in considering both sides. So it's a very dangerous concept, neutrality, when it comes to life and death issues. There's no neutrality. Thank you, doctor. Uh, I'm embarrassed because I'm out of uniform. I'm actually a pastor. So <laughs> even in my small congregation, I'm seeing medical staff uh, unsolicited suggesting people stop care and let their lives end at a minimum. I'm wondering what is appropriate pushback in situations okay. like that? So it's, a, it's an excellent question. And so I want to distinguish the difference between all of us. Who in the room here is in terminal? Okay, so all of us are going to die, and so allowing people to die is not assisted suicide and euthanasia. There comes a time, like in my own father's case, where, you know, it's checkmate. I, mean, I couldn't feed him through, i go through the details. My late wife, um, you know, I, we were in the hospital in the last week of her life, and I said, you know, we could probably do a CAT scan and do, um, do some more testing, and she said to me, you know, um, I don't think it matters. And I started another sentence, and before I could get the sentence out, she said, I don't think it matters. I'm ready. And I got kind of teary-eyed, and I said, well, I'm not. And she said, I know, but we'll get you there. <laughs> and, you know, there comes a point where you have to say, we've done what we can do, and we're not trying to ignore the reality that we're all terminal. That's one issue. On the other hand, the problem with that whole paradigm is that there are people willing to give up when it's not a imminently terminal condition, and that's too easy. And there are people who say, well, there's no point in feeding tubes, they don't work. Well, that's wrong, too. They don't work under some circumstances, they work beautifully under other circumstances. So to blanketly say people shouldn't have feeding tubes is wrong. You know, so uh, it's very important, what are the circumstances in that scenario you're talking about? And unfortunately, with this whole paradigm, there is a mentality of, uh, well, this is too much trouble, they're not worth it. And uh, you know, this, this whole thing that Jeanette Hall experienced, this is 18 years now that she's had extended life. It's, by the way, it's important, the words are important. I don't like the word prolong. We've prolonged Jeanette Hall's life. No, we've extended her life. She saw her son graduate. She didn't see him get married yet, but, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's to come, maybe. I mean, that was, uh, you've, it's a wonderful little video clip of her son sometimes <laughs> talking about that phenomenon. Well, I'm, I, haven't got, I did graduate, but I haven't gotten married yet. So, We know. have quite a few questions, Dr. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sorry. I have two that I think are similar. What are your thoughts on DNRs? And then another one, explain the PULST, P-O-L-S-T. Well, both of those are almost separate talks, but real quickly, the DNR, uh, I would not encourage anyone to label themselves DNR until you know all the circumstances. So like in the last four days of my late wife's life, we said, it's checkmate. It's okay, we're not going to resuscitate her. But up until that time, if you label yourself DNR, you receive fewer transfusions, fewer antibiotics, you're not as likely to get hospitalized, and you're not as likely to get intensive care. Intensive care means that you get one-on-one -on -one nursing, excellent nursing. That's what intensive care means. It doesn't mean that you've got to be DNR or non-DNR, but that's the way some of my colleagues and residents and people look at it. Like, what's the point of putting you in the intensive care unit if you're DNR? That's what they say. Because I want intensive nursing care. And it made a difference in my dad's case. He lived longer. He extended his life because of excellent nursing care. And that's, uh, that's a sad reality. So the other one was about Pulse. Pulse is Physician Order for Life Sustaining Treatment. Just think of the name. It's a physician order. I don't even have to have your signature in Oregon. Did you know that? It's recommended that I get your signature. In other words, the power's gone to whom? Not to you. So I would not recommend that you fill out a pulse form. What I would recommend is that you designate who would speak for you if, God forbid, you can't speak for yourself. That's an advanced medical directive. That's the bottom line of that. I could give you all the details, but it'd take 30 minutes. Yes? Oregon Right to Life website has information about DNRs and which pages to fill out and which to leave blank. Exactly right. And then if you want a longer version, I was a co-author with about 10 other authors uh, 
on a paper, cathmed.org, and you just look up Pulse, P-O-L-S-T, and there's a 30-page paper explaining what the position that Oregon Right to Life takes, which is basically a synopsis. I tried to make it a brief answer there. Other question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, you kind of are covering it right now. Youth, um, people that have Alzheimer's and dementia, are you running into more situations where the family is choosing to want to end that person's life? Well, you said it very well. Am I running into a situation where the family's choosing? Yes. Let me relieve you of my suffering is essentially what's going on. You know, you contrast that with people who I just was speaking with a, a woman who took care of somebody in Louisiana. She's a doctor. And she agreed to buy this ranch with the proviso that the, Sam was the guy could work on the, life, on the ranch for the rest of his life. Well, of course, Sam had a stroke, became disabled, had Parkinson's. She literally carried Sam with her to her church. The church rallied around her. He had a full life extended until the end of his life. Now, Parkinson's is very disabling. As you know, my dad died of Parkinson's advanced Parkinson's difficulty swallowing. Your thinking slowed down. You can't, you can't do the things you used to do. Now, he's a wonderful, he, he's my dad, you know. He, he was a World War II veteran. He was a Brigadier General. He was uh, fought in Korea, Vietnam. He, was, he had several careers after his major career. Um, people, people in the hospital didn't know who he was, you know. We had to put a collage of, of his pictures in life and made people come into the hospital room and sign that in order they'd see who the person they're taking care of. And they're not just taking care of this body that now looks like they went through Dachau. And so he needed to be treated with dignity. So that's true dignity. That's true compassion. And to take somebody who now can no longer think as fast. I can't remember things. Sometimes I have to think of the word that I'm trying to, to say. You know, I got a few slides out of order here. You know, that, that this is, does it make me less dignified? No. And when we start adopting that mentality, it's a dangerous society. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Do you believe that hospice care has changed its basic philosophy, and if so, how? The hospice care. Okay, and unfortunately, how hospice care at first in Oregon didn't allow the hospice worker to go in when there was an assisted suicide going on. That's changed. So they go in now, they essentially participate indirectly, if not directly. Second thing is that many people are going into hospice, some hospices, and they aren't imminently dying, and it seems like they're dead two days later. There are nurses asking, not all nurses, of course, <laughs> asking for, what's the pain medicine? Well, he's not in pain. But he needs to have pain medicine. Why? He's not in pain. Well, she may have to take care of a lot of people, and she wants to have control. Well, he, she calls a doctor. This is a real story from somebody I know well for the last 35, 40 years almost. Anyway, the bottom line is she's a hospice nurse, and she saw one of her colleagues who wanted to have control by having pain medicine. The doctor refused because I'm not giving pain medicine. He's not in pain. So you cannot have the same sense that we once did. The hospice is a wonderful option. Palliative care is a wonderful option. But there are a million doctors in the country. They don't all have the same attitude. There are probably even more nurses. And there are some that have great integrity. And I'd love to have them take care of me when I'm disabled and, and need that. Because nursing is the heart of medicine. And to have that corrupted is just sad. So thanks Thank for you. the question.